Hey everybody, before I start this video, I just wanted to let everybody know that I have a new podcast channel that I'm doing with some other guys called the Gaytriarchy Podcast. It's in my related channels. If you guys want to go check it out, we do a show every 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time on Fridays. So yeah, come check us out and on with the video. Why fourth wave feminism is the only feminism that matters, at least right now. Hey, it's Prince of Queens, and it's been a really long time since I've made a video about this concept of fourth wave feminism, which ended up becoming one of my most viewed videos, and I still seem to be the main feminist critic that really talks about it at all. Most people still refer to contemporary feminism as third wave feminism, as if maybe the completely politically incorrect Bush years never really happened or something. While many intelligent people are starting to use the phrase intersectionality to refer simply to the current incarnation of Marxist, feminist, slanted, university and social media driven feminism. I don't mind the abbreviation from what I often refer to as fourth wave intersectional feminist social justice boiled down to intersectionality. I don't mind. But I've also even personally taken to calling these people intersectionals, usually as an insult. In fact, one of my favorite things to do when I see a particularly cringy Facebook comment is to reply by saying, Looks like we've got an intersectional, as if they are a person infected with some sort of zombie corruption, like they might be in some sort of an RPG or something. Still, I was talking to a family member recently about another family member who we have come to realize probably has a personality disorder or two, and we were talking about her past a bit only to have the realization that it's the present that matters. It doesn't really matter what happened to this person in her childhood, so much as how she acts to us now. And that rings true for feminism as well. You see, pop feminism is what actually matters, and I reckon that has always been the case to a certain degree. Pop feminism is the current moment in time, at any given moment of time, and it's all that matters. The ever-morphing and ever-emotionally manipulative feminine zeitgeist that we currently call feminism will never leave us, but whatever shape it takes at any given time is what actually matters. That's why, although there were radicals during the first wave, most people just thought of them as wacky women who thought that women inherently deserved a right to vote by virtue of the fact that they were female, even though only men who had signed up for the draft and male property owners could vote at the time. Did the suffragettes take it quite a lot further than wanting the vote? Well, I'm actually sure they probably did. I believe some people who have researched them noticed that they certainly did. And they probably said stuff, especially behind closed doors. I'm sure that there was endless man-hating coinciding with man manipulation and flat-out lying to the press about what they really wanted. And then in the end, they settled for the vote. And then history was written, and the suffragettes got the women the right to vote. In the civil rights era of women's liberation during the 1960s and 1970s, there were more well-documented radical feminist man-haters. But people look back at that era as one of positivity, and they don't see signs where women wrote, smash the patriarchy so much, but rather things like, Women's Lib Now. After that, during the late 1980s and all through the 1990s, the true era of third wave feminism, which remember, I witnessed firsthand growing up in Seattle, born in 1982, 
Well, there was more and more man-hating and intersectionality theory was being introduced in academia, people weren't constantly demanding that somebody have intersecting oppressions in order for that person to have an opinion. Well, I'm sure things were more extreme amongst feminist academic types who were already starting to give the talking stick to the black lesbian in the wheelchair first at every one of their meetings. For the most part, the pop feminism of the third wave was about abortion rights during the post-Reagan era, sexual assault, female strength, empowerment, a dash of queer issues, and legitimate sex positivity. Trust me or not, but I was there. I remember what was popular in the third wave of feminism, and it actually seemed kind of cool and edgy to me at the time, though I was a pretty young person, no older than a teenager. The Andrea Dworkin accusation that porn made men rape was not considered cool. That's not what most people were into. And all the bisexual feminists that I knew in Seattle were really into Betty Page and buying sex toys that they'd hopefully use with men or other women. Correct me if anybody else lived in a feminist city in the 1990s and remembers things differently. But of course, that stuff really did die out culturally during the Bush years, and the only people who stayed feminists were the radicals, who are generally man-hating lesbians that have no social skills, women with childhood abuse issues, or women that recently had a messy breakup. But after everybody gets sick of their crap, the feminist radicals always end up leaving the party, hissing and calling everybody misogynists, and everybody laughs at them on their way out, but they'll quietly retreat and try to figure out their next scheme about how they plan on defeating men or maleness, because that is the collective motive that will always hold these people together. Yes, they can get allies to fight their battles with them or for them, both male and female, by appealing to the wishes of the female population in their nation or by guilting the men properly of their nation. But the underlying motive that unites any movement that fights for female exclusive benefits will always be a movement that exists as a way to take power and resources away from men. This is purely logical, and it's just the facts, and there's no way that I can sugarcoat it. You see, on average, men produce more economically than women and are more interested in being in positions of power. They work longer hours, which is why there's more males represented in government. Therefore, in order for women as a social class to gain something, men have to be the ones giving something up because the majority of wealth and power is always going to be slanted towards the male half of the population. Female benefits don't fall from the sky, as much as the feminists would maybe like to deny this obvious reality if it's convenient for them. And they obviously try. Fortunately, the best feminists can ever come up with is to tell men that giving up their masculinity, giving up their shot at a fair future in education or careers, and whatever resources they might have to give up in taxes and family courts, they tell these men that giving these things up magically also helps men out somehow, too, because patriarchy hurts men too, because reasons. By doing so, feminists are basically saying to men, Hey, patriarchy, why don't you smash yourself? It will feel good and will be a learning experience in why being male was bad in the first place. But don't expect any consolation prizes for giving up whatever we want from you. We have been owed it for centuries. 
You're welcome. Thus, when people who thought like this were given a massive budget during the second half of the Obama administration, not only was that a mammoth mistake strategically for the Democratic Party, but it was a gigantic turning point historically because it showed in clearly documented detail just how heinous the thought process of these women and deluded men actually are. In the past, feminists could have been private about their true nature a lot better than they can now, because, fortunately for humanity, the internet never forgets. And in case somehow it does, I really hope that there are some people that are working on cataloging all of this stuff and creating a museum around intersectional feminist social justice culture from the 2010s because that would be a really fascinating museum some somewhere in the future right you see during the fourth wave of feminism which according to wikipedia started in 2008 but really kicked into gear in 2012 feminists used their same strange amorphous female supremacist nature to create an international power-hungry pop cultural zeitgeist intent on finally achieving the power that the radicals had only dreamed of in past decades. However, aside from simply taking place mostly online, fourth wave feminists realized, unlike the women's interest groups and radical female supremacists of the past, that in order to properly brainwash the masses into supporting their cause, they had to do three main things. The first being to glorify victimhood, the second being to guilt everybody who wasn't victim enough into being willing to constantly go to bat for the alleged victims, even if it defied their own logic. And finally, they had to make sure that females were always at the top of the totem pole when it came to who was allegedly a victim. This obviously had the goal of putting as many feminist politicians into office and seemingly into positions of power in corporations and media as well. But we had the fortunate advantage of having it done online, where the feminists not just had to lie a lot where they could be caught because lying on the internet is not a good idea, well, all the while using emotionally manipulative rhetoric to achieve their goals, thus being simultaneously caught red-handed by millions and millions of internet users who were watching YouTube videos of all of this. You see, we all got to see with our own eyes just how selfish, hypocritical, weak, petty, dishonest, malicious, and downright unintelligent these allegedly strong female leaders really were. Not to mention generally physically unattractive. And we got to witness them make complete and utter fools of themselves over and over on the world's stage. That had never happened before in feminist history, of course, and they had the hilarious stupidity and seeming pre-existing contracts with financial backers already in place, which inspired them to try to slightly adapt their stances in order to handle the public critiques, which would ultimately be their downfall because the feminists tried to offer everybody in the world something with intersectionality, and it didn't really work. Thus, the battle between TERFs and the transgender activists was probably the first issue that came up amongst the hardcore feminist ranks, but eventually debates about Hillary Clinton not being a real feminist obviously became huge, and everybody was accusing somebody or other of being privileged on the internet. All the while, Islam was being glorified beyond belief because that was seemingly the one thing that every feminist could hold as the sacred oppressed. Also, they all 
seemingly had to lose every debate almost as if they were doing it on purpose so that they could accuse their opponent of mansplaining as if he was sexist for engaging in a debate to begin with because then they get to be the victim which was better than being strong and actually having the their intellect and arguments on their side now Obviously, their little strategy didn't really work, of course, and public opinion is moving more and more away from this. But what I want to leave you with is the following. The spirit of feminism will never leave, and the good authors who self-identify as feminists simply don't count as anything that actually really represents what feminism truly is. You see, we find out decade after decade that there will always be a group of women who each separately hate men, who then find each other and socially reinforce their misandrist belief. And then they go on to begin scheming about how to take power away from whatever men they can because they assume they could be doing a better job if they only had made things more tailored for females, though of course they want somebody else to do the heavy lifting. Yes, this mentality that is best described with the simple word feminism, this mentality is the problem itself. The root of the problem that will apparently always plague our sexually dimorphic species is best described with the word feminism. And I'm sure there's a male equivalent as well, but I don't want to get into it probably for the rest of this decade. However, though feminism will probably never leave us, we also always have to deal with the here and now. And what is the here and now? Well, it's the fourth wave. So let's examine fourth wave feminism. Fourth wave feminists loved to form cyberbullying hate mobs to harass people they were usually lying about or making an example out of for innocuous things like making stupid jokes that were mildly sexist. Fourth wave feminists were basically, in effect, Islamists. Fourth wave feminists want women to be perpetually traumatized by any victimization they have ever experienced because that is marketable for politicians. Fourth wave feminists all pretend to hate gender, but not so much the female gender, just the cis part about gender, which is why they are all supposedly non-binary, but they're also female. Fourth wave feminists are really into being fat, so long as it's a woman being fat, and they all hate it when men explain their positions or sit in a comfortable way on public transportation. These things aren't always the case in feminism, but they are the current case, and they need to be dealt with currently and thoroughly. Hopefully we can get them out of universities this time, but they'll probably just regroup on the internet somewhere, I imagine, and they'll come back again in 20 years like they always do. In the end, towards the end of the night, the crazy, humorless, man-hating lesbians always leave the party screeching and hissing, thinking in their heads that they will take over the world next time. However, it's up to the rest of us to take down receipts of what exactly caused them to get kicked out of the party this time. That's all I have to say for this video. Stay tuned.